A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. The word of the Lord. May Haman understood that even with careful planning and patient waiting, life didn't always go according to plan. She probably learned this early in life, being the sixth child out of eight siblings. This lesson was reinforced when she had a relationship that could have ended in marriage, but to a man who did not share her first love to Christ. Most significantly, she learned to trust her Lord when she decided to train as a nurse and serve at several centers in Australia before joining the Anglican-based Gona Mission in Papua New Guinea, where she would minister for six years until her martyrdom in August of 1942. The Gona Mission thrived near the coast of New Guinea, housing a school, mission, and base for other missionaries who served tribes in the jungle interior. But with the invasion by the Japanese in World War II, it was clear that May and her co-workers would not be safe. Rather than evacuate, many of them wrote their bishop and expressed their desire to stay, even if it meant losing their lives. In a radio broadcast sent to May and the other Anglican missionaries, Bishop Strong reiterated their resolve, saying, I cannot foretell the future. One thing only I can guarantee is that if we do not forsake Christ here in Papua in his body, the church, he will not forsake us. Let us trust and not be afraid. On paper, May Heyman looks like the kind of person who many in Western culture would say had too much to lose. She was 37, established in her career, unafraid to take risks, loved by her coworkers, and newly engaged to fellow missionary Vivian Redlick. Yet she and her close friend, Mavis Parkinson, believed otherwise. We are in God's hands, they said. If he calls us to suffer, we are ready to suffer. We must do his work. When the Japanese invaded the beach, May fled into the interior with Mavis and Reverend James Benson, where a Papuan priest and his village sheltered them. However, the Papuan Christians could be jeopardized if the Japanese discovered them. So May and her companions journeyed to Port Moresby in hope of evacuation. However, she and Mavis were separated from their group and were found by another tribe of Papuans who betrayed them to Japanese soldiers. They were imprisoned in a coffee store shortly before being led to a freshly dug burial ditch. Both May and Mavis were bayoneted and tossed into the grave. Because May and her fellow missionaries remained, their martyrdoms were not the last word in Papua New Guinea. The church grew after the war. Where the coffee store once imprisoned the women, a priest's home now stands, a visible sign of hospitality in the name of Christ. The life of May Haman urges us to remember that our suffering is never without purpose in the body of Christ. Regardless of circumstances, 
and however our plans may change. Our greatest assurance is found in our triune God, who never changes and who never fails us. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This is the word of the Lord. The life and witness of Bill Wallace, for to me to live is Christ. From 1935 to 1950, Bill Wallace served as a surgeon and medical missionary in Wuchow, China. A Knoxville native, he came from the Southern Baptist tradition with a deep love and appreciation for foreign missions. At age 17, he believed without question that God had called him to serve as a medical missionary, a calling that he resolved to pursue without wavering. Today, some Western Christians might feel a tension or discrepancy between a secular vocation and ministry work. Debates continue to surface over whether or not Christians are called to work of social justice or to the work of evangelism. But Bill Wallace would remind us that such a polarization is false. In a letter to his home church, shortly after he arrived in China, he wrote, We have a wonderful hospital with a wonderful opportunity to serve the Lord. We are not only ministering to their physical needs, but to their spiritual needs as well. Fifteen years of faithful work among the Chinese people bore much fruit, and Bill was dearly loved by his community and those he ministered to. When Japanese forces began to bomb the region, he did not want to evacuate and leave the people in his care. When evacuation for all the city was imminent, he led the efforts to safety, safely evacuate all patients and workers in the hospital and returned back to Wuchow in 1945, when it was safe. However, tensions towards Americans rose at the outset of the Korean War. And though he could have left for his homeland, Bill chose to remain at his hospital in the wake of the communist takeover in China. Eventually, he was imprisoned on false charges of spying for the American government. Kept in solitary confinement, he was beaten routinely and endured intense mental and emotional brainwashing until his death two months later. While the government claimed he had committed suicide, a fellow missionary who worked with Bill and examined his body saw no evidence of hanging, but rather a body that had been beaten and broken mercilessly. He had endured much suffering, but was home at last in the presence of the Savior who had suffered for him. After his burial, a group of Chinese believers went back to his empty grave marker and inscribed, For to me, to live is Christ. Bill's life and ministry was characterized by simple, dedicated service to those whom he offered physical healing but ultimately spiritual and total healing in the gospel of Christ. He accounted the cost, and he knew that Christ was the true gain, both in this life and in the life to come. The next scripture reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. I read, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. 
I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. A leader in Christ's army, the life and witness of Janani Luwum. The security of the ordinary Christian has been in jeopardy for quite a long time. We have buried many who have died as a result of being shot, and there are many more whose bodies have not been found. These words sound as though they could be describing the reality of many Christians throughout the world today. Dated February 8th, 1977, this letter was co-signed by Anglican Archbishop Janani Luum and the bishops of Uganda in response to ever-increasing violence at the hands of their country's dictator, Idi Amin. Janani's words would soon ring prophetic of his own martyrdom just eight days afterwards, as he himself said of that letter, I'm signing my own death warrant. Nearly a century before Janani's death, it was the martyrdom of Ugandan Christians that spread the gospel and gave birth to great courage among believers, which has continued to this day. Growing up in a Christian home, Janani knew the truths of scripture and the faith. However, it was not until his mid-twenties that he gave his life fully to Christ. When that moment came, he testified, Today, I have become a leader in Christ's army, and I am prepared to die in the army of Jesus. As Jesus shed his blood for people, if it is God's will, I will do the same. He began his ministry in 1949, first serving as an evangelist, then ordained as a parish priest in the Anglican Church. As the years progressed, so did his influence and prophetic voice, placing him as the Archbishop of Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Bogazare in 1974. However, Janani's voice could not be tolerated by Idi Amin, who sought power at the expense of his own people. On February 14th, 1977, the dictator ordered for Janani to meet with him, where he charged him with plots to overthrow the government and ordered the Ugandan media to report the claims as facts. Janani's wife, Mary, tried to visit him after he was detained, but soldiers would not allow her to see him. An eyewitness in the prison with Janani recalled seeing several of the guards hitting him in the face. In response, he heard Janani say to them, you are hitting me because you have power, but you would not have this power if it had not been given to you from God. The next day, Janani and two other Ugandan leaders were found in a framed car crash, intended to cover up the executions and absolve the government of blame. Thousands of Ugandans attended the Archbishop's memorial service their very presence testifying that they too would stand firm in their faith, even if it cost them their lives. Recalling the words of the angels at Christ's own tomb, former Archbishop Sabiti told the worshippers, the tomb of Janani is empty. Indeed, the hope of the resurrection emboldened Janani as a shepherd of the flock, a martyr of the church and a leader in Christ's army. May we live with the same hope and speak the same gospel with the same boldness. A reading in Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who publishes peace, who bring good news of happiness, who publish salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. This is the word of the Lord. Empowered by the word, 
the life and weakness of Romulo Saunia. When a person looks at the face of Romulo Saunia in our chapel, one sees a face of joy. But this joy was not because of an easy life. Romulo's joy came from Christ and a love for God's word. His influence was so great among the Peruvian Christians that when he was martyred in September of 1922, his killers shouted, we got him. They might have ended his life here on earth, but God's word could not be silent, nor can the work God that had begun through Romulo. When he was younger, a donkey hit a, a donkey kicked, kicked Romulo in the head. His village nickname came dead and stupid one. But they could not have been more wrong. Romulo was brilliant and gifted in language, in learning language, especially the Greek and the Hebrew, which led him to work with white light, Bible translation, and other organizations such as the film project of Jesus. Romulo was responsible for the entry Bible being translated into his own language of Quechua, and his voice can still be heard today through the Jesus film in Quechua as the voice of Jesus. As a vocal Christian leader in Peru, Romulo and his family were often threatened by communist lead group called the Shining Path. The group began in the city of Ayacucho, a name meaning corner of death. And they were known for killer, and they were known for their killing of Christians. One morning, a stranger knocked on Romulo's door. He confessed that he was a member of the Shining Path and that he had pretended to belong to the church to spy on Christians and to murder Romulo. But the words of the scripture that he had here were not letting him rest. Romulo led him in a prayer saying, you need to stop wasting your life and give it to Jesus instead of the shining path. It is the only way to stop this torture in your head. The man became a Christian and as a symbol of his freedom, handed Romulo the gun that he would have used to shoot him. A few months later, Romulo members of his family, and other Christians were traveling near Ayacucho to visit the burial place of his martyr, grand, or martyred grandfather, and to encourage Christians who are hiding from the shiny path. On their return home, the terrorists ambushed them and killed both Romulo and his brother, Ruben, in front of their parents. While the killers rejoice that they have finally silenced this powerful Christian, Romulo was inevitably in the presence of the God he loves. And listening, the countless voices rejoice before the throne. Today, many Quechua villages are still hungry for the word of God and eager to, uh, to, their, to, hear their, to have their own copies of the Bible. Praise God that we will join our voice with Romulo one day in heaven, and that God's word continues to shine the light in the darkness paths. Several years ago, I was invited to participate in the Synod for the New Evangelization in Rome, and while there, I visited the Basilica of St. Bartholomew. It's on an island on the Tiber River, Isolo Tibernina, one of the oldest sites in Rome. It used to be a 
center of healing back in the days of the Romans, honored the god Asclepius there. But now it's a Christian uh, church, a basilica, a favorite place of St. Francis to visit. But the thing that attracted me in that basilica was this icon. And it was given to me as a gift to take back. <clears throat> it's one of the things I treasure most that I've received from various Christians around the world. It's called the Icon of the New Martyrs. Now, the original is much, much larger than this. It would fill up about the space of our organ. And it's at the very be uh, beginning, the head of the uh, basilica. It's, it's an amazing thing to go and see. And then around the, uh, the sides of the basilica are little chapels which have special memorials and remembrances of the martyrs who are commemorated on this icon. This was the result of a vision of Pope John Paul II, who thought that when we think of the martyrs, we think of those of many ages, centuries past, the early church, but martyrdom is a living reality in the world today. And so he commissioned this icon to be done. The painter is a woman who is a member of the community of St. Egidio. That's one of the most encouraging streams of renewal within the Roman Catholic Church today, focused on Bible study, Bible reading, sharing the gospel, working with the poor in the city of Rome. It's an amazing community. And she had a special vocation to do this particular painting. Now, I want to give you a very brief introduction to it. Uh, first of all, at the, at the center of it all is Jesus Christ. Jesus ascended in heaven, surrounded by the angels. When you look at this icon, you will find angels are present in a number of the scenes. And it reminds us that though we don't see angels very often, the reality of angels is throughout the scriptures and in our present life and often in times of distress and persecution. The reality of angels becomes more evident to the people of God. So the angels are here. If you'll notice the figure of Christ in his hands and in his feet are the stigmata, the marks of his passion. Just as in the figure of Christ in our dome, if you look there, you will see also the marks of the passion. The painter who did that originally had no marks, no nail marks in the hands of Christ. As we were looking up at it, it seemed something was missing. And I said to him, Petru, you have to go back up and put the passion marks of Jesus in his hands, just as they are here. Because it reminds us that even in heaven, in his glorified body, Jesus bears the marks of his passion on earth to remind us of the suffering that he has gone through for the sake of, of the world. Now there are two trains of white-robed martyrs surrounded Christ, led in this particular uh, presentation by John, the beloved disciple, and by Mary. These are two traditional figures often portrayed in art beneath the cross. And here we have John and Mary leading the martyrs up to the throne of Christ himself to worship and adore the risen Lord. If you'll notice very carefully, there are two very small figures. These are children. And they remind us that in the history of martyrdom, very often, Young children, teenagers, and even much younger have been called to give their lives for Jesus Christ and have done so uh, un unto the shedding of their blood. Here's the banner that separates heaven from earth, as it were. This is the title that is given to this entire uh, icon. It's in Italian, but you don't have to know too much Latin or Italian to figure it out. It's from the book of Revelation. These are they who came through the great tribulation. And it shows that there is a very thin line separating heaven on earth. And one in which the martyrs themselves have, here they are, waiting to be taken into the presence of Christ. Now beneath the, the, the banner, um, you have a very strange uh, thing to think about. You know, this whole painting is uh, done in kind of classical Byzantine style with the figures uh, somewhat 
stationary, static, stylized. And yet, this icon has unmistakable marks of modernity about it. It's a very violent image. You see submachine guns. You see a cattle car filled with prisoners. You see folks in the act of being imprisoned and executed. And here you have a concentration camp of barbed wire. But it is a concentration camp that has become a cathedral in the shape of a cathedral. And it points to the fact that often in our experience, concentration camps have been cathedrals because they have been places of prayer and sacrifice. And in the central column is the cross and the paschal candle, the Easter candle, signifying that death is not the final word, that Jesus Christ is alive. He is the resurrection and the life. And then a Bible opened with this text from John 17, that they may all be one as you, Father, and I are one. So may his disciples, Jesus prayed, become one. So this represents a kind of a ecumenism of blood, of martyrdom, united not by culture or na nationality or denomination, but united through Jesus Christ in the Word of God. Now, I only have a few seconds to tell you some of the figures. A few uh, years, a year or two ago, we had a wonderful student. I wonder how many of you remember Meredith Conrad. She came to us as Meredith Treat. You knew her. Well, you know, as sometimes happen, people meet here at Beeson and fall in love. And so she met a Beeson student from Canada, and they fell in love, and now they've gone back to Canada. But while she was still here, Meredith developed a research project on this icon. And we still have her work, if you'd like to see it, in which she tells the stories. There are over a hundred different figures. And each one of them represents a fascinating story of sacrifice and service and love for Jesus Christ unto martyrdom and death. Here are a few of the figures you might recognize. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In fact, two of our six martyrs are represented on here. Bonhoeffer is one. And here is Janani Luam. We heard about him today in the very act of being seized by the soldiers of Idi Amin and put to death because of his witness for the gospel and for Jesus Christ. Um, there is right behind Bonhoeffer a woman with red hair. Her name was Edith Stein, and she was taken to a concentration camp because she hid and protected Jews in Amsterdam during the era of the Third Reich. Uh, what's amazing about this whole configuration is the fact that these martyrs come from east and west, north and south. They are Catholic, they're Orthodox, they are Protestants. Uh, evangelicals, not only Bonhoeffer, but this person, Paul Schneider, another Protestant pastor in Nazi Germany who was uh, put to death in Buchenwald because he refused to stop preaching the gospel even in the concentration camp. Uh, there are also um, in this panel two, uh, two, two figures. I was surprised to learn this when I f was shown this uh, icon of the new martyrs. There are two Baptists here. How did that happen? Well, one of them is not so surprising. It's Martin Luther King. The other one was surprising to me. These four figures found in prison, these are all imprisoned in the same prison in Romania when the dictator Ceausescu brought great uh, tribulation on the, the people of faith and the people of God. One of them was a Catholic. One of them was uh, uh, Eastern Romanian Orthodox, another Greek Orthodox. And the fourth one, I think it's this fellow in the blue robe, was a Romanian Baptist. Now, they were all in prison together. They had one Bible among them. They divided the Bible into four sections and would pass it back and forth in the cells. And together, 
They were all, all four executed while they were still in prison. But I thought that's a wonderful representation of martyrdom. United in the word of God across these confessional lines, faithful witnesses unto the shedding of their blood. Well, uh, there are others I could mention, but I think uh, I'm just about uh, out of time. Here's a figure, a priest. He's from Albania. Albania was probably the most militantly atheistic country on earth for a long period of time until the fall of the Iron Curtain. He was put to death because he's shown here in the act of baptizing a baby. He had been forbidden to do anything in terms of ministry of the church, but the mother appealed to him to baptize her baby, and so he did that. He was arrested. He was put to death fulfilling that act of his ministry. Well, um, I wanted to share this with you, and uh, you each have these little cards. Did you see these when you come in? Take that with you, and as you have occasion, think about these, these great uh, figures of the faith, some known, some many unknown, not, not, uh, not named, not known by name. They're anonymous to us, but not anonymous to God. And occasionally we're reminded of the martyrs in what we sing, as we read the scriptures, as we think about that great text. And this is all an explication of the great text of Revelation 7. The throng of the martyrs who come from every nation, every kindred, every tribe on earth, uh, united in singing to the Lamb who is at the center of the throne, to Jesus Christ. Irina Ratushinskaya was a Russian Christian. She was a poet. She was uh, an artist, a writer. She was put in a gulag and stayed there for over seven years before she was finally released. She died just last year. While she was in prison, she would write these little poems that have been published in a volume, well worth checking out. And this was one called Believe Me. Believe me, it was often thus in solitary cells on winter nights, a sudden sense of joy and warmth and a resounding note of love. And then unsleeping, I would know a huddle by an icy wall. Someone is thinking of me now, petitioning the Lord for me. My dear ones, thank you all who did not falter, who believed in us in the most fearful prison hour. We probably would not have passed through everything from end to end, our heads held high, unbowed, without your valiant hearts to light our path. So as we think of the martyrs, those who are suffering and being persecuted, who are maybe about to be martyred, we lift them to the Lord as we have done today in this service, as we often do at Beeson, in our prayers. And by the witness of this woman, Irina Ratushinskaya, those prayers, though unknown to her in terms of their source, those prayers sustained her in difficult, dark times so that she did not falter, she did not fail in the most fearful prison hour.